Gisuk Yukit, who Kaklik Knuhus Akpashki, who Kaklik Gwen Phillips, who Ninik Dunaka. The language I just used is the Dunaka language. It's an isolate language. It's related to no other language in the whole world. It's absolutely centering for our people. It tells us who we are. It helps to identify where we belong. We know our territory as the Tunaka Nation by the landforms and in our language, our identifying factors. Remembering who we are is absolutely important for us as we look forward to who it is we want to be again in the future as nations, as families, as communities. We've been given a vision provincially that speaks to healthy children, healthy families, healthy communities, but also having a sense of vibrancy. And what does vibrancy mean? How do you measure vibrancy? Our elders said, it starts with a sparkle in the eye of a child. Do our children have a sparkle in their eyes? What does that actually mean for a child to have a sparkle in their eye? It's a sense of belonging, a sense of love, a sense of purpose, a sense of safety, being inquisitive, wanting to know things. For many years, our people were cut off from the, the transmission of traditional knowledge, cut off from the transmission of sense of belonging, residential schools, just the processes of colonization in general. The fact that the dominant cultures coming to Canada suppressed and in actual fact didn't even give any recognition to the uniqueness of the cultures that were here led us to where we are today. For us as Indigenous people, we don't want to be called a blanket of Indigenous people anymore. Sure, recognize us as that in a relationship, but to actually acknowledge who we are as unique nations and our languages and how important those languages are to concepts of relationship, to concepts of well-being, to concepts of future. So for us right now where we are, we're trying to remember who we are, trying to remember all of those things that held us together as strong, healthy families, as strong, healthy communities and nations for thousands of years. It's only been 100, 150 years that we've been in this chaotic state. And my elders have always said, if you can remember the taste, you can rebuild the recipe. And that's where we are right now, is remembering, remembering what it was like, remembering our language, remembering our songs and our stories, remembering how our families supported each other. We've been embarking on this journey of a health transfer, when really what we're looking at is health transformation. And it's really about transforming systems in general. Because you don't arrive at a health, at a health status that is a, a really good health status without having lived a healthy life, a healthy lifestyle. Now sometimes mm, our behaviors are driven by our circumstances. And sometimes our circumstances are challenging. Either the physical environment, we haven't got clean water. We don't have safe houses. The social environment, we may be dealing with a lot of dysfunction in our family well-being still because of having been cut off from our, our wholeness, our cultural wholeness. And so as we are looking back to remember who we are, we're also projecting forward in our rebuilding. So it's absolutely important that we remember who we are as First Nations people, as the Kutunaka, as the Shakwakmuk, as the Inflakapmuk, as those unique nations of people. BC is home to 35 unique languages, so we know we have at least 35 nations in BC. And so this concept of nation to nation, it's about our language and our stewardship responsibilities. That's where our nationhood comes from. Our stewardship is our connection to the land. Our language helps to place us there. And our dialects are different because of where we were placed on the land. Some of us were on the open ocean. Some of us were in high mountain areas. Some of us were in the interior of BC where we see fruit growing areas and plains and rattlesnakes. So our environment is very different, very unique to each nation. So we've got to remember who we are from the cultural perspective. And what colonization really is, is a, is a suppression of our culture by being oppressed by a dom dominant culture or cultures. So when we think about the concept of the determinants of health, it's legitimate for us as First Nations people. In fact, it probably meant something to us before the scientists came and branded it as the determinants of health. 
For us, we knew that our social environment was absolutely key to how people would grow. We also knew that our physical environment impacted us. Impacted us immediately from our, our home environment to how healthy our broader environment is. When we go back to our cultures, each of us uniquely, we recognize that we had social support networks. We had concepts of aunties and uncles, not just blood relatives, but a role that that particular group of people played within our society. The concept of the grandmother, the grandfather, and what their roles were, even understanding that in most of our societies, as Indigenous populations, we were actually matriarchal. So in many instances, our women were the ones who ran the camps. They made the rules, they kept the rules, they sometimes even chose the male leaders that would be the protectors and providers. So our gender balance went out of whack with the process of colonization, particularly when we saw that dominant culture coming with a concept of actually the man owning the wife, that the man owned the woman and the minor children. Now that values clash with the First Nations population was significant and deep. Our women ran the camp. Then we were taught we were property. So again, the thinking about what happened to our culture and it's being pressured by this dominant culture. Right now, the balance of our gender roles in our communities is out of whack. Our men have been very badly impacted by the process of colonization. Their roles have been impacted more than the women's roles. Yes, the women's roles absolutely in our inability to be those, those nurturers and the residential schools taking our children away. We didn't have the ability to actually pass on those skills as nurturers. We have to reclaim those responsibilities again. We know that our gender roles are critical, that if a child doesn't have a nurturer and a protector and provider, they're going without. We also know that our genetics has been impacted by the trauma that's occurred to us generation after generation. The epigeneticists, those scientists who look at disease and genetics, they've actually confirmed that if a child suffers in their early child development, if they don't have a strong social support network, if they don't have the nurturing that is believed every child should have, that they may likely have inflammatory disease later in life. Now, when we look at the rates of diabetes and heart disease and other inflammatory disease across the indigenous populations, it's extreme. And if you look at our early childhood experience, it too has been extreme. So we know that we have to nurture, nurture the man, nurture the woman, nurture the family, help rebuild healthy health practices, help rebuild coping skills. Why do we have such an opioid crisis? Because we have very poor coping skills, many of us. And Canadian population in general, we're not, we're not conditioned to actually support each other. It's about competition. Collaboration and support is, is, is not what we, we nurture in schools or in institutions. That's absolutely what we nurtured as First Nations people. Collaboration in our communities was essential to our existence. Everybody had a role. Everybody was expected to perform the role for the greater good of the people. So the very concept of, of, of again, values and the clash of values between the contemporary society and our societies is there. It's extreme. It has to be recognized. And we, again, have to have the ability, the recognition, the resources to go back to doing what we know is important for ourselves. We've got to rebuild our health services so that they make sense to us. Many of us, we're just focusing on the physical self while we know that our intellectual self housed here in our brain actually impacts our emotional self housed here in our stomach. Every time we have a thought, it can make us feel good it can make us feel not good. Too many negative influences through your mind without a strong spirit to actually, ah, I'm not going to let that bother me, it can actually cause a lot of disease to occur. So again, without having healthy practices, without having good health services that actually treat the whole human, we perhaps won't go forward with education. We perhaps aren't going to get a good job. So when we think about the determinants of health, this is what we're talking about right here. To actually have healthy children, you have to have a strong foundation of a healthy culture. 
You have to have a strong social support network. You have to have recognition of the different roles of the parents and support for both of them. Understanding that our genetics imprint our children. Methylation of the DNA, that's a big word I learned about. It just basically means that things can change over time. Your DNA is different when you die than it is when you're born because of your experiences, because of what your environments have done to you. Whether it's a social environment and a lot of negative energy and a lot of being told you're no good, being told you're all of these things, your body responds, your spirit responds. Physical environment, the same thing. So our genetics is impacted by our physical and social environments, our built and natural environments. So we know that if the environment becomes toxic, it actually affects our ability to have healthy children right at the, at, the, at, the, at the level of our DNA. So again, for First Nations people, this is not new to us. This is just other people's words on how to describe things we knew already. We talk about all things being related. My own language, a kukpukam is a tree or a root. It's, it's about how you take your life from the earth. So a plant or a tree or anything that literally connects with a root. A kukpukam nam. Just adding that nam suffix, it now actually turns into a human's children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. So it's a term that takes us from the health of the earth to the health of the human, just by adding a suffix. Such an empowering concept, and we know this. So we have got to actually remember to rebuild, each one of us through our own cultural lens. Rebuilding our structures internally within our communities to do the things we know we need to do. Where now we spend a lot of resource on health services, treating disease, treating disability, treating things that are perhaps otherwise avoidable by having a strong foundation. So this isn't a, a hierarchy. This is actually like a pyramid with a very strong foundation. And if you have this foundation and you rebuild these things inside of your own community, you will likely then eventually have healthy children again. So the idea is behind this, this is all internal work. This is us doing our work, community development and nation rebuilding. Rebuilding the environments, helping to rebuild these structures in our own communities. Avoiding as much as possible those external services and supports and doing the work we need to do to heal. To heal from those processes. To heal from those impacts of those processes that have been around us for so long. The important components are the relationships that are actually in that culture, are the relationships both to the people and to the land. That is our identity as an Indigenous person.